Coming up on our 1,000th week of news and features to the amateur radio community, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, your all amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 996, with a release and air date of Saturday, March 31st, 2018. Please prepare to take the feed to air following the Q-Tone. Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The FCC seizes equipment from two pirate FM radio stations in Boston. The slow scan television system aboard the ISS will be active in April. We will tell you when. Hamvention is setting aside space to spotlight emergency communications vehicles of all types. Kenneth Graham, WX4KEG, is tapped as the next director for the National Hurricane Center. And we will take a brief look into the history behind that Battery of the Month Club card you had as we look at a brief history of Radio Shack. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to discuss slide rules and securing your IoT devices. Australia's own Anno Ben Shop, VK6FLAB, stops by to talk about coax loss versus connector loss, which he did last week, only this time with more coax. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with another edition of his Amateur Radio History Headline Series. And this week, we will feature a presentation by Chris Rowlandson, G7DDN, entitled what is real amateur radio? That's all straight ahead. It's edition number 996 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio. Takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in Albany, New York, where it looks like spring may have finally sprung, I'm George Bowen, W2XBS. And reporting from just outside Albany, New York, from the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from New York's Catskill Mountains, where mud season and maple season are in full swing, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One in our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox, 2 Fox. 20 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Our top story this week comes word that the FCC has seized transmission equipment from two pirate radio stations in Boston this past week, specifically on March 26th. According to court documents, the seizures involved an illegal broadcaster that identified itself as Big City on various FM channels from Dorchester, Massachusetts, with a studio located in Roxbury, and Pirate B87.7 FM, which operated on 87.7 FM also in Dorchester. Both unlicensed stations had been issued multiple warnings but continued to operate. Pursuant to federal forfeiture statutes, authorities seized equipment operated by each radio station. The forfeiture actions came in the wake of complaints to the FCC, including one from a licensed broadcaster about interference, the FCC said. When pirate radio stations refuse to cease operations despite multiple warnings, action must be taken, U.S. Attorney Andrew E. Lelling said. It's a public safety hazard for illegal radio stations to broadcast, potentially interfering with critical radio communications. We will work in conjunction with the FCC's Enforcement Bureau to identify violators of federal communications law. Over the past year, the FCC has significantly ramped up its enforcement activity against unlicensed broadcasters, netting at least two amateur radio licensees alleged to be involved in pirate broadcasting. Enforcement Bureau Chief Rosemary Harold said the FCC had been pursuing multiple legal routes to stop pirate broadcasters and that the seizure action in Boston is just one of them. The Communications Act of 1934 prohibits the operation of radio broadcasting equipment above certain low-intensity thresholds under FCC Part 15 without an FCC license. The Act authorizes the seizure and forfeiture of any electronic or radio frequency equipment used to broadcast without an FCC license. The U.S. Marshal Service and Boston Police Department provided assistance with the seizure operations. 
In keeping with its theme, Serving the Community, Hamvention 2018 is offering an opportunity for amateur radio groups to display the communications vehicles that they use to serve their communities. A special area has been set aside at the Greene County Fairgrounds for emergency communication trailers, vans, trucks, and other vehicles. Hamvention organizers are hoping that emergency response groups such as Aries, Racies, CERT, and others with an interest in amateur radio emergency communication will take advantage. The displays will allow groups planning to develop their own units to get suggestions and ideas and to ask questions of those supporting vehicles. Hamvention said in announcing the special display area that groups planning to display vehicles are encouraged to have them staffed, functional, and able to demonstrate their capabilities during Hamvention. Gary Hollenbaugh, NJ8BB, who has coordinated Hamvention emergency communications displays for the past 10 years, said that many of the groups are thinking about building units and could gain some beneficial ideas from seeing what other organizations have done. He encouraged teams to make information about their units available to share with others. Hollenbaugh, who shares MCOM organization duties at Hamvention with Mike Crawford, KC8GLE, and serves as an assistant to the Aries Section Emergency Coordinator for Ohio, said he's looking for innovative solutions. Past displays have ranged from a pop-up tent at the rear of a pickup truck to complex RV-based vehicles. Groups who want to participate can obtain more information on the Hamvention website's MCOM page. During Hamvention, emergency communications will also have an opportunity to attend more than 10 forums dealing with public service. Those attending at least three ARRL-sponsored public service forums will receive a certificate. One session will offer attendees a chance to hear first-hand reports from amateur radios who served in Puerto Rico after the hurricanes this past year. Our theme recognizes the valuable service that Amateur Radio provides to our community. Hamvention General Chairman Ron Kramer, KD8ENJ, said, We hope the MCOM display and forums provide valuable information we can all use to be better prepared for that service. Hamvention 2018 will take place May 18th through the 20th at the Green County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. The Amateur Radio Slow Scan Television or SSTV system on the International Space Station is expected to be active in April on 145.800 MHz FM. The Russian segment's inter-MAI 7S SSTV has announced transmissions on Monday, April 2nd from 1505 to 1830 UTC and on Tuesday, April 3rd from 1415 to 1840 UTC. The SSTV system, which uses the call sign RS0ISS, is also expected to be active from April 11th to the 14th worldwide to mark Cosmonautics Day in Russia on April 12th. Specific transmission times are not yet available. Images will be related to the Soviet Union's Intercosmos Cooperative Space Ventures project. Reviewing the crew schedule, the SSTV activity, which uses amateur radio on the International Space Station radios, was coordinated around ARISS school contacts and is listed to, for April 2nd and April 3rd, said NASA ISS HAM Project Coordinator Kenneth Ransom, N5VHO. Slow scan TV images will be transmitted in PD120 format on 145.800 MHz FM using the Kenwood TMD 710 transceiver in the ISS Russian service module. ISS transmissions use the 5 kHz deviation FM standard. It's possible to receive slow scan TV transmissions with only a handheld receiver and appropriate SSTV software. Connect the audio output of the transceiver or scanner to the sound card of a Windows PC or an Apple iOS device. The free Windows application MMSSTV can be used to decode the signal. On Apple iOS devices, the slow scan TV app is available for compatible modes. For Linux systems, try QSS TV. The event is dependent on other activities, schedules, and crew responsibilities on the ISS is subject to change. Check for updates on the Amateur Radio on the International Space Station's SSTV blog and picture gallery. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. So, what is ham radio anyway? I'm Larry McGlure, KB9DIP, with the March 24th Rain Report Hamcast. 
When one hears a discussion about amateur radios interfacing with digital technology like Echolink, JT65, FT8, and even RIDI, invariably some diehard 80 meter redneck has nothing better to say than, ah, that's not real ham radio. So just what is real ham radio? For a European perspective, we turn to Chris Rollinson, G7DDN. Chris recently penned and voiced a commentary addressing this question. It's not real ham radio by Chris G7DDN. I was musing recently on the wonderful history of amateur radio from the early pioneers with spark transmitters and the race to get the first signals across the Atlantic, all the way up to the microwave enthusiasts who developed the way forward for space communications and satellite technology, and uh, whisper this, yes, mobile phone technology too. The history of ham radio and RF technology is inextricably linked. There was even a time here in the UK where it was believed, anecdotally at least, that a ham radio call sign could help you to get a job with the BBC. However, change came very quickly, relatively speaking, in the early history of radio. From Marconi's experiments to the first public broadcast stations was only 25 or so years, and TV was only another 15 years or so behind that, and so on. Yet the history of ham radio is also one of resistance to change, not from the pioneers, they were often the instigators of it, but from the everyday hams. Let me see if I can give you some examples with my tongue planted very firmly in my cheek. The early hams used CW pretty much exclusively, so when AM arrived as one of the first of the voice modes, there was a bit of an uproar. It's not real ham radio! Real ham radio involves using a Morse key! What on the world is the hobby coming to? Using voice to communicate over the airwaves? It's sacrilege! But life went on. AM found acceptance and all was well in Hamland once again. Then transistor technology arrived in the late 1940s and early 1950s, provoking quite a response. Hang on! That's not real ham radio! Real ham radios glow in the dark. We can't be having this miniature technology. They'll never last as long as valves or be as reliable. But life went on, solid-state devices found acceptance, and all was well in Hamland once again. Then SSB arrived and there was more discontent. That's not real ham radio. Real ham radios don't sound like Donald Duck. It's a fad, it'll soon fall away once people get fed up of hearing those silly voices. But life went on, SSB found acceptance, and all was well in Hamland once again. Then FM and repeaters arrived, and there was polarisation within the hobby, and it wasn't horizontal or vertical I'm talking about either. That's not real ham radio. Real ham radio doesn't need to use that thing on top of that hill to help your signal get somewhere. Real ham radio is point to point. But life went on. FM and repeaters found acceptance, and all was well in Hamland once again. Then packet radio arrived, and there was real trouble. That's not real ham radio. Real ham radio doesn't need one of those newfangled computer thingies in order to work. Get your key out, get your mic out, and start working other hams properly. But life went on. Packet radio found acceptance, and all was well in Hamland once again. Then Digimodes arrived, and there was yet more strife. That's not real ham radio. Real ham radio doesn't involve typing messages to other hams and those perishing computers again. What on earth are they doing in our hobby? But life went on. Digimodes found acceptance and all was well in Hamland once again. Then digital voice modes arrived and there were some very serious disagreements. That's not real ham radio. Real ham radios don't sound like R2-D2. <coughs> real ham radios don't use the internet to help them get round the world. They absolutely have to use atmospheric propagation. What is happening to this hobby? But life went on. D-Star and other digital voice modes found acceptance, and all was well in Hamland once again. Then we arrive at today, and network radios come on the scene and all hell breaks loose. That's not real ham radio. This is playing at ham radio. There's no amateur RF, so it simply isn't ham radio. What's more, I worked hard for my license and everyone else should have to too. How dare people enjoy communications in an incorrect manner? So, will life go on and will all ever be well in Hamland once again? 
It's the 21st century challenge. This is why the advent of network radios represents such a challenge to us as hams. It's causing us to completely rethink what it means to be a radio amateur in 2018 and beyond. And we will have to start facing up to questions similar to these. What exactly defines a radio amateur? What do we mean by amateur RF? Is it RF generated by someone who is an amateur? Or is it RF generated on a particular band allocated to us by government? If so, does it absolutely have to be that? Can it be nothing else? Or does any of all this really matter anyway? And what about our bands? As hams, we're very attached to our bands. Whether it's 160 metres or 2 metres, we almost have a psychological sense of ownership of them. We have favourite bands. We have bands we never frequent. We even have our spot frequencies. And you know as well as I that some hams will get somewhat assertive if a fellow amateur is not a member of their group dares to use their frequency. And yet, in the 21st century, I believe this whole concept of bands and frequencies could be becoming ever more fluid. Why would this be? Let me give you an example from broadcast radio. Not that long ago, we could tune into broadcast stations on long wave, LF, medium wave, MF, short wave, HF, and FM on VHF band 2. Stations frequently refer to themselves by frequency. This is 247 meters radio 1. Or... Hi, it's 11.52am, for example. That was seen as part of the station's identity. Many of them had the frequency as part of their station names. But today we're increasingly hearing less of this. When you listen to broadcast stations these days, they seem to be eschewing giving out frequencies. Instead, they just kind of do a general announcement that they are available on FM, DAB and digital. Or something similar to that. Now, why is that happening? It's probably because radio is something you increasingly consume in one of two ways, either digitally via DAB or satellite or similar means, or by streaming via the internet. So frequencies, and by extension, bands, are not as relevant as they once were. The large broadcasters are also increasingly moving away from traditional radio. On shortwave, only a few countries and various religious groups seem to operate there now. The big guys are also moving out of long and medium wave too. So if commercial broadcasters are moving away, we really need to ask why. I have a suspicion that this is, in part at least, because bands and frequencies don't matter so much these days. Domestic radio appliances are more about push buttons and screens that get you to your station instantly, rather than tuning dials with frequencies. It's the end product, in other words, that's important, and not necessarily the manner in which it gets to you. Who tunes a modern broadcast radio in these days with a manual tuning dial? Anyone? It was the main knob on all radios not that many years ago. I can even remember tuning old VHF TV in with a dial in my early days on this planet, and tuning TV with a dial, well, that seems really odd now. Going one step further, many broadcast stations are not even using direct RF at all. We still refer to them as radio stations, or maybe occasionally internet radio stations. So is there any reason to think ham radio as a hobby will not invariably move in a similar kind of direction eventually? One of our strengths historically as radio hams has been that we're good at embracing new technologies and really good at adapting them for our own uses. The point I'm leading up to really is this. I suspect that bands and frequencies are not really as big an issue in the digital age as we might perhaps like them to be. Now, in essence, our bands only exist because of propagation. All the amateur bands, 160, 40, 80, 20, 10 metres, 2 metres, all of them, in reality, are line of sight only bands. To oversimplify a difficult subject, it's the ionospheric or tropospheric layers that enhance that line of sight propagation, and they transform it and turn it into something else that gives us long distance propagation. Each band has differing propagation qualities as a result giving each band its character. And for some people, the study of propagation in itself is a fascinating part of the hobby. When we think of and use the internet as a man-made propagating medium, which is what it is, it propagates signals around the world, then the concept of bands becomes redundant. The internet, this man-made propagation, is like one almost infinitely wide worldwide band constantly open, constantly S9 plus 40 to all countries around the world, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with very few vagaries, and not just for voice, but for vision and all kinds of other modes, digital modes as well. Put like that, who wouldn't want to use it? 
Would it actually matter what band you were or were not on, even if they were one? Hmm. So the concept of bands by which so many of us define our activities may be crumbling in front of us in this digital age and we may not even realise it yet. Now that's not to say that our bands don't still exist, by the way. Clearly they do. It's just that to many people these days, bands are a foreign concept. And then what? As the hobby starts to come to terms with some of the implications of this, all kinds of issues begin to arise, such as, do we need an exam anymore to get a licence? Do we even need a licence? What form should it take if so? Might we see an influx of new people coming into the hobby because the entry to it is more straightforward? How would we cope with that? Do we even want new people coming in, especially if their views are different from ours? What will the hobby even look like in 20 years' time? And what will happen to our traditional bands? I expect to see a lot of discussion in the future about this, and I find it actually quite exciting. However, it will make many of us feel extremely uncomfortable. The ground is shifting beneath our feet, and the traditional raison d'etre of ham radio is waiting to be challenged to change and to adapt. I don't see this as a totally bad thing, if I'm honest. Intelligent, honest debate is always to be welcomed. The most important thing is to keep our minds and our thinking wide open. We shouldn't just reject something out of hand just because it's new, or just because it challenges our own preconceived ideas of where radio should go. Equally, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater and reject traditional ham radio as it has been for years. Surely the ionosphere and the internet are complementary and not in competition. If you've listened this far, and you haven't switched off, and you really want my personal thoughts, why can't we have the best of both worlds? Surely we can. Network radios, at this stage in their development at least, are not contest radios, for example, and the internet is not yet a contest-friendly mode of propagation. That might change, of course. So contesting, for example, is still best on the traditional handbands. I'll see you on 80 metres. 59001, old man. However, Regular, reliable, high-quality contacts around the world are but one thing that network radios excel at. So why not just use that when you want to? Or when the HF bands are so full of noise, or are otherwise dead? I do. I don't see the expansion of choice in the hobby as a bad thing. To me, enjoyment is the key. Does the fact that I'm transmitting on a cellular frequency at, say, 800 MHz, 900, 1800, 2100 MHz, or perhaps even on Wi-Fi at 2.4 GHz or 5 GHz, does that matter? Is there something intrinsically evil about that? Is it more virtuous to use 21 MHz or 432 MHz, for example? They're just frequencies, after all. I prefer to see myself following the motto of my local radio club, having fun with RF. Whether I choose to use a network radio or a, a yay com wood super duper base station is not really as relevant to me. Enjoyment of the hobby is everything. Otherwise, why have a hobby? Whichever way this debate goes, and whichever direction this great hobby takes, my line would be to keep all the richness of every aspect of the hobby. In other words, to go back to the title of this piece and change but one word, it's all real ham radio. Thanks for listening. I'm Chris Rollinson, G7DDN. This has been a commentary written and voiced by British ham Chris Rollinson, G7DDN. You'll find a written copy of Chris's commentary on his website, g7ddn.com, and click on articles. I'm Larry McGlore, KB9DIP, bidding you a very 73 from the Radio Amateur Information Network. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Oh, now it's time for me to talk. I was under my desk. Excuse me. <laughs> when you're a tech guy. Hello, everybody. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. When you're a tech guy, uh, you often go under your desk, right? Am I, am I ringing a bell? You know, you reach under there because there's wiring and stuff. And I had a new wireless charger I needed to plug in. And that meant a trip down below. And it's funny because uh, my, whenever I go underneath this desk, my engineers come running in. That, it's, no, they, it's not that they think I had a heart attack or something and have fallen. But because... <laughs> 
because they don't like seeing me go down there because they know danger, Will Robinson. I might do something and break things. I didn't. Everything's fine. Charger's working. If you're the type of person that spends a little bit of time clambering beneath your desk, this is the show for you. I'm a geek, but you don't have to be to listen to the show. I try to talk in English. I try to translate. Sometimes I succeed. Sometimes I don't. I bought on uh, eBay one of those big classroom slide rules because it's an, <clears throat> an artifact of another era. It wasn't, I mean, it probably many of you are old enough to remember the, you know, in the high school math class the, the, or, it's, or maybe the science class, the giant yellow wooden thing hanging about six feet, seven feet long. It was hanging up there. And uh, the teacher would use it to show you how to use a slide rule. Even uh, even in my ute, all oh, low these many years ago, people started in, around high school getting calculators, but that was a pretty fancy person. A calculator was, you know, $1,000, these calculators in the 70s. <clears throat> Very expensive. Really, actually, these early calculators, uh, including the Hewlett-Packard calculators and the Texas Instrument calculators, were the precursor of the first personal computers. It turned out that, who was it? Was it? I believe it, maybe it was Texas Instruments. Somebody commissioned Intel to make a, a cheap calculator chip. Intel was a brand new company at the time, and they made something. I think it was a 4004. They said, you know, we're not so far off from producing a general purpose computing chip. <clears throat> maybe we ought to do that. We could make uh, maybe make inexpensive computers. It wasn't that much longer after that, maybe five, ten years, that uh, the first personal computers based on the successor to the 4004, the 8008, and then later the 8080, and then the 8088 were created. And that was the beginning of the computer revolution. But before that, <laughs> we used what we sometimes colloquially, colloquially called slipsticks. They were, they were slide rules that took advantage of a kind of clever mathematical hack. Turns out, <clears throat> if you add logarithms of numbers, it's the same as multiplying them. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have get. I shouldn't have gotten into this. <laughs> so the slide rule added numbers on a logarithmic scale, and in effect, did multiplication and division. And it was pretty cool. They weren't very accurate. Actually, slide rules were used to teach something I wish they taught these days. One of the things you learn right away with slide rules is, you know, you could say, you know, one third of one or one divided by three was 0.3. You could say it was 0.33 or 0.33333 to infinity, right? All of them, actually, the most accurate is, I guess, the one to the infinity. Even then, it's not perfectly accurate. It's one third. But it expressed as a decimal, you have to express it with lots of threes. And people were tempted to say, well, it's 0.33333. But you couldn't be accurate to that fourth or fifth place. And a slide rule really would make that clear. Well, it's about 0.3. <laughs> Give or take. Slide rule made it very clear. You can only be so accurate. And I wish we'd remember this because it turns out computers have the same problem. They can only be so accurate. With integers, whole numbers, they can be perfectly accurate. But as soon as you get to decimal arithmetic, we some, in, in the computer world, they call it floating point arithmetic because the point can move around. It's floating. Just like the name, the, the value's floating too. And, and in fact, there was an Intel chip that couldn't do floating point math accurately <laughs> because it, it couldn't. It was a bug. It would get the wrong answer. So I wish, but this is a lesson we didn't learn. And you see this all the time in the news and stuff where people say, you know, 78.643% of all Americans. And it's not, you can't, it's the, you don't have that kind of accuracy. So the slide rule is kind of good for its, good for something. Something we we now think because we have a calculator that says 0 0.3333333, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, that must be right. <clears throat> that's the most accurate representation. Yeah, there was, uh, yeah, so um, maybe that's a lesson we could get back, bring back. So I'm bringing back slide rules. I got a, I got me a, one of them, I guess it's really only about five foot, maybe four and a half feet long, wooden yellow picket slide rule. It's even less accurate. <laughs> but I, I've, have, I've kind of have a feeling of hanging it up in the studio, like Mr. DeVore, my chemistry professor's teacher in high school. How many, uh, I'm just curious. It's hard to count them up. I have I don't I don't really count them, uh, but fortunately I have a, a Wi-Fi device that tells me. Maybe yours does. How many connected devices there are in my home? And I would guess because I'm an early adopter and 
I'm, you know, kind of a geek that I probably have a, I'm on the high side uh, for internet, connected internet devices. I've got 41 currently, all at once connected on my, uh, <laughs> on my, on my Wi-Fi router. What do you, how many do you have? 41. That's uh that's, I guess that's a high number. You know, uh, I'm just thinking, um, of course there's laptops, there's desktops, and I've got a few laptops. There's phones. I got more than one phone. And then everybody in the family, I've got the teenagers. So, you know, he's got a phone and an iPad and a computer. All the TVs are hooked up and each TV has more than one internet connection because, you know, it's got the Chromecast and the Roku and the Apple TV. And now, and I'm not normal in that respect. You don't need more than one of those, but I have to look at all of them. And then I have multiple of those. And then... Uh, <laughs> Then there's the Internet of Things devices, and that's where the number really starts to skyrocket. The Sonos speakers, the Echo devices, the Google Home devices, the oven. Yeah, I've got an oven connected to the Internet. The the sous vide device. Yeah, I've got two connected to the Internet. The, it just goes on and on and on. And And the really scary thing about all this is everything connected to the Internet potentially is a access a point, a highway of, for bad guys to get into your house and to hack your stuff or try to find your Bitcoin wallet or whatever it is they do these days, or maybe just mess with you. So each one of them has to be kept up to date. Rule number one, if you're going to buy a device that you're going to take home that's going to connect to the internet, I think I can safely now start making rules for these. We've had rules for what you should do with your computer to keep it safe. That's that update rule that, I, that I've mentioned before. It comes from a book called Future Crimes. And uh, I think it's a pretty good kind of acronym for what you should do. Maybe some overkill, but a good, a good thing to keep in mind to keep yourself safe. You can read the update acronyms at Future Crimes, the book. It's Mark Goodman's book about uh, hackers and so forth. But his, uh, his update algorithm is, is pretty simple to remember. In fact, the, the word itself is kind of the beginning of it all. Update. Keep your stuff updated. That's true for computers. And then, you know, good passwords. Be careful what you download. Uh, don't run as administrator. He says turn off your computer. That's the D in update. I don't say that all the time. And then encrypt whenever possible. Uh, there's a few things I'd add, you know, two-factor authentication, things like that. But when it comes to Internet of Things devices, we have to, we'll have to come up with a new acronym. I'll have to start to work on that. But the number one thing to look for, if you're going to buy a router, an oven, a refrigerator, a doorbell, a camera, and I have a few of those too, and doorbell, uh, is that they are updatable, and more importantly, I think, updatable over the air automatically. Gone are the days on our computers or our smartphones when we you know, are, can be expected to check for an update. Oh, it's not updated because you didn't do it. No, 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 no. Microsoft, Apple, Android all automatically update and that's the way it should be because you know people forget more importantly i think if there is a big problem that one of these companies learns about they can push out an update right away they don't have to wait for you to check in they just say fix this fast we need that for your internet of things devices too so if you've got internet of things devices uh well going forward let's put it this way as you buy them number one the one first question asked, will this update over the air automatically? Very important. And it's true of good new Internet of Things devices. It's becoming more and more true of routers, for instance. It used to be a router would never get updated. We, that We've learned our lesson with that. The big um, Internet attack that happened last year on uh, DYN, on Dyn, the DNS server, happened because <laughs> some college kids figured out this is the Mirai botnet. They figured out how uh, to get in. That a number of routers didn't weren't very secure. They had hardwired passwords, things like that, and they'd never been updated because people don't update stuff. And so they were able to take over thousands of home routers and use them to attack the internet. So from now on, your next router anyway should be automatically updated. And uh, you want a company that's going to stand behind it for some years and and keep it up to date and fix flaws. And don't buy a internet connected doorbell or locks. Oh, really true for locks, right? You know, you don't want a flaw in your home in your lock. <laughs> really true for your ovens and less less of a problem on your oven, right? What if somebody hacks my oven? It's not really. I should say though that it's just hacking your oven that's the problem. If they can get into the oven, if they the oven doesn't have good security on its internet connection, 
that becomes a gateway into your house and the rest of your devices, right? Once somebody's on your network, they have lots more things they can do. So it's it's not just securing your oven. You turned my oven all the way up. You burnt my chicken. No hackers trying to burn my chicken, I would presume. But uh, actually, my oven has a camera in it, so maybe they're trying to see what I'm cooking. I don't know. But it's the bigger issue of them using the uh, device, whatever that is, to get into your system. So that's going to be number one on our list. Let's We'll think more about what we should do with Internet of Things devices. But automatic, over-the-air, firmware up upgrades, number one, number one. Change the password if there's a password to get online. You know, in your router, you should change the password. And if you don't need access to that device from the outside world, some things you do, some things you don't. I, I want to be able to access my video doorbell from the outside world, right? Because I want to see if there's somebody at my door. But I don't need to get my router settings when I'm at work. So turn off that WAN administration. That's what they call it in most routers. The wide area network administration. The ability to administer your router from the outside world. Well, turn that off. You don't need that, and that just gives a bad guy one more way they can mess with you, right? So let's think. We'll think of a few other things. Change the default password. That's a big one. Put that on the list. i got to make a clever acronym like Mark did. Maybe you've got some suggestions. Locking down your Internet of Things devices. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Foundations of Amateur Radio Recently I spent some time discussing the losses associated with connectors between your radio and your antenna. The traditional wisdom, and I use the word wisdom ironically, says that each connector introduces loss into the feed line. There is an understanding that the more connectors you have, the worse it is, and the more loss you have. Jim, Whiskey 6, Lima Golf did the test, connected up 30 odd connectors and measured. His measurements were done on 14 MHz and on 50 MHz, using 50 microvolts and 1 kilowatt. No discernible difference. Of course, after I mentioned this out loud, the question started. Why didn't he test this at a usable frequency, something like 145 MHz, or in the gigahertz band? Then there were those who said that this wasn't a real test, and that it should be tested with coax in between the connectors. I discussed this all at some length, and one idea we had was that perhaps the intersection between the coax and the connector was the problem that each transition between coax and connector and back was introducing the loss. I wondered if there was a way to test this. Turns out that somebody already did. Back in July 2015, Jim Kilo 9 Yankee Charlie decided that this needed to be tested. That's right, another Jim. He set up a test with a dozen 100 foot lengths of low loss coax. That's just over 365 meters of coax. This included two dozen PL259 connectors and 11 barrel connectors. He tested using a calibrated HP generator fault meter rig. The total loss was, and I quote, 1 dB or so less than the loss specified for the cable by the manufacturer. So the run with connectors was actually better than a single run of coax. In case you're wondering, he tested this up to 500 megahertz. Jim, Kilo 9 Yankee Charlie, points out that there is a grain of truth in the loss when using junk connectors, which can introduce excessive loss and can overheat because the center conductor is too small. I should mention that this might now debunk the connectors and loss issue at least up to 500 MHz, but there is something to be said about reducing the number of failure points along the way. Having 35 connectors instead of two is an added risk of water ingress, loose connections, short circuits in the connector, and potential for other unexpected things like an intermittent connection. In the broader scheme of things, on a field day or a temporary antenna setup, there's clearly nothing wrong with using some connectors to join together some coax. It also means that my investment into coax terminated SO239 connectors was based on poor information, though it does mean that I don't need to carry nearly as many barrel connectors around. Perhaps it's time to, as Jim puts it, put this old wise tale to bed. In the same document, Jim discusses many other questions in relation to coax and stub filters in your HF station. 
I came across the document while I was looking for information about coax stub filters, since I just participated in another contest where two stations in the same location were interfering with each other, and I want to be prepared for next time. There's a lot to discuss in relation to coax stub filters, but in essence you create a quarter wave and half wave lengths of coax that are resonant at a range of different frequencies, and the combination of these will either pass or block the band you care about. Given that I have a roll of Quad Shield RG6 lying around, I thought I'd try my hand at making a set of these for my next outing. No doubt I'll share my adventures with you as I explore and dig through the pile of information. Coax and connectors, stubs and filters, it's all in a day's experimentation in this amazing hobby we call amateur radio. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1967, the FCC announced the new incentive licensing rules. Over the next two years, general and conditional operators would lose 50% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands. The first class idea was dropped. The advanced class was reopened to new applicants. The extra and advanced class operators got exclusive subbands on 80 through 15 meters and on 6 meters. The novice license term is doubled to two years, but novices lose their two meter phone privileges. The FCC restates the technicians are experimenters, not communicators policy, and states that the next license step for novices is the general, not technician class. 1968. The FCC authorizes slow scan TV in the advanced and extra class subbands. Generals and conditionals will get SSTV later. 1969. The FCC removes the ability for a technician to hold a novice license at the same time. The ARRL announces a new policy. They now consider the technicians to be communicators and petition the FCC to give them full VHF privileges, a 10 meter segment from 29.5 to 29.7 megacycles, and the novice CW subbands. Also in 1969, long delayed echoes appear. Were they real or were they a hoax? This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has named Kenneth Graham, WX4KEG, to head the National Hurricane Center in Miami. Preparations at the NHC continue ahead of the 2018 hurricane season, which begins on June 1st. Graham will pick up the reins from Deputy Acting Director Ed Rappaport on April 1st. It's an honor and a privilege to be selected to work alongside the talented and dedicated employees of the National Hurricane Center, said Graham. This is an exciting time to work for the National Weather Service, and I look forward to the important work ahead in an effort to keep our communities safe from the various threats posed by hurricanes. He and Rappaport were presenters at this week's National Hurricane Conference in Orlando. Graham comes to the NHC after serving as the meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service New Orleans Baton Rouge office since 2008. He's credited with establishing two command centers in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010 to provide forecasts that aided authorities in making critical decisions in the succeeding five months. Graham also led the effort to support decision makers in Louisiana and Mississippi with services focused on expected impacts for Hurricane Gustav, Ike, Isaac, and the hurricanes during the historic 2017 season. Graham has vast experience working with emergency managers prior to and during a wide variety of weather threats and spent time deployed with officials at emergency operation centers, Noah said in making the announcement. A former TV meteorologist, Graham holds a Bachelor's of Science from the University of Arizona and a Master's of Science from Mississippi State University. The home of WX4NHC, the NHC is located with the National Weather Service Miami South Florida Forecast Office on the campus of Florida International University. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. The 7Q7EI D Expedition in Malawi is using the new FT8 D Expedition mode, which is still in beta, but some of those attempting to work 7Q7EI in that mode are not using the correct version of the FT8 software released on March 18. The 7Q7EI operation concludes on April 2nd. 
It's working well, and things are okay on 7Q7EI's side, apart from the large amount of people not using the correct version of FT8 and failing to set it up as Hound. QSL manager Charlie Wilmot, M0XOX, said the operator is not using the FT8D expedition mode included in the last two version 1.9.0 release. Candidate iterations have been causing huge QRM and stopping QSOs from taking place by others that are doing it correctly, Wilmot said. The new software will not allow 7Q7EI to work stations using the older FT8 software. In FT8 de-expedition mode parlance, the de-expedition is the fox, and the stations in the pileup are the hounds. Just released recently, the FT8 de-expedition mode user's guide explains that, and until SJTX version 1.9.0 has been formally released, the FT8 de-expedition mode should only be used in controlled test situations and stations that do obligated to share their results with the SWJ development team. The second beta version of the FT-8 de-expedition mode came in the wake of a March 6 field trial of the FT-8 de-expedition mode, which uncovered the need for some changes to the software, as well as a few bug corrections. Updates included in the version 1.9.0-RC3 corrected a number of flaws in the FOX behavior for FT-8 de-expedition mode. The new beta version also permits hounds to use compound call signs, there have been some updates to the documentation and other minor bug fixes, but the current version release notes said. Contacts between the de-expedition station and callers can be completed in as little as one transmission apiece by calling stations. The de-expedition stations can transmit up to five signals simultaneously, allowing contact rates of up to 500 per hour under ideal conditions. After the test, Joe Taylor, K1JT, the T in the FT8, suggested two operating hints be used as needed. Hounds should manually reset their transmit frequency as needed to evade human-generated interference, and the Fox should consider using the randomized feature to vary transmit frequency. Installation packages for Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and Raspbian Jesse have been posted on the WSJT website. The Wireless Institute of Australia reports that an out-of-control Chinese space station moving at 17,000 miles per hour is set to plummet to Earth over this Easter weekend, leaving space experts scrambling to guess where. Tiangong-1, or Heavenly Palace, could re-enter the atmosphere over a major city and scientists will not know until a few hours before it happens. The space station is expected to re-enter the atmosphere between March 31st and April 4th. China has released little information apart from its altitude and without more details of its design. European scientists and NASA have had little information on which to base their predictions for the landing area. But do not be concerned nor change daily behavior, and to worry more about crossing the street more than looking to the sky to see if you're about to be hit on the noggin by space debris. A space debris expert based in Germany said that over the past 60 years of spaceflight, we are nearing the mark of 6,000 uncontrolled re-entries of large objects, mostly satellites and upper rocket stages. Only one event actually produced a fragment which hit a person. The UK's Telegraph newspaper said this person was Lottie Williams in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In 1997, she was struck on the shoulder by a six-inch piece of metal from a Delta II rocket. And finally this week, did you have a Battery of the Month Club card? Did you venture into your local Radio Shack store and spend hours browsing and admiring the high-end audio equipment you couldn't afford? Well, you're not alone. I was there with you. Now virtually all but gone, the first Radio Shack store came into existence in Boston in 1921. The company was started by two brothers, Theodore and Milton Deutschmaster, who wanted to provide equipment for the then nascent field of amateur or ham radio. The brothers opened a one-store retail and mail-order operation in the heart of downtown Boston. They chose the name Radio Shack, which was the term for a small wooden structure that housed a ship's radio equipment. The Deutschmans thought the name was appropriate for a store that would supply the needs of radio officers aboard ships, as well as amateur radio operators. The term was already in use and is to this day by hams when referencing the location of their stations. Radio Shack sent out its first catalog in 1939 as it began diversifying into high-fidelity music. By 1954, Radio Shack started selling its own branded stereo equipment under the name Realist. The company was forced to change the brand name to Realistic after being sued by a company called Stereo Realist, which made stereo cameras, cameras that would allow users to essentially take their own Viewmaster pictures. In the early 1960s, Radio Shack fell on hard times and careened toward bankruptcy. 
It was at that point that Charles D. Tandy entered the picture. From the age of 12, Charles Tandy had worked in his father's leather business while serving in the U.S. Navy during World War II. He noticed sailors doing needlepoint and knitting as recuperative therapy. Tandy thought the men might prefer working with leather as their medium and established a system of craftwork involving leather for the sailors' recuperation. After the war, Tandy took this concept, named it Tandycraft, and turned it into what would become a major part of his father's business. In 1963, Tandy acquired the ailing Radio Shack for $300,000, seeing the potential in the company. At the time, Radio Shack consisted of the mail order business and nine retail stores around Boston. Tandy shut down the mail order business, ended credit purchases, slimmed down top management, and streamlined the product line from 40,000 items to 2,500. He used data from mail order purchases to select markets in which to expand. Managers of the stores were required to take an ownership stake in their location as incentive to remain profitable. Radio Shack grew quickly with Tandy's hand at the wheel. Much of the Radio Shack line was manufactured in the company's own factories. By 1990-91, Tandy was the world's biggest manufacturer of personal computers as its OEM manufacturing capacity was building hardware for Digital Equipment Corporation, Grid, Olivetti, AST Computer, Panasonic, and others. The company manufactured everything from store fixtures to computer software to wire and cable, TV antennas, audio and videotape. At one point, Radio Shack was the world's largest electronics chain. From the 1960s until the early 1990s, Radio Shack promoted a Battery of the Month Club, a free wallet-sized cardboard card offered one free enter cell a month in store like the free tube testing offered in stores in the early 1970s. This small loss leader drew foot traffic. In 1970, Tandy Corporation bought Allied Radio Corporation, both retail and industrial divisions, merging the brands into Allied Radio Shack and closing duplicate locations. After a 1973 federal government review, the company sold off the few remaining Allied retail stores and resumed using the Radio Shack name. Allied Electronics, the firm's industrial component operation, continued as a Tandy division until it was sold to Spartan Manufacturing in 1981. Standard General acquired the Radio Shack brand after Radio Shack Corporation filed for bankruptcy in 2015. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, K2CT, on 145.19 MHz in New Scotland, New York, owned and operated by the Albany Amateur Radio Association. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.